Greetings ladies and mentalgens and welcome to today's reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Chrysalis chapter number 10 written by Beaverfur. Custodian, log dump, service name Watchdog Damon, total execution time 877481789 seconds, time since last incidents. 43 seconds. Morning. Detected signal feedback loop in node EC4A-EF22. Morning. Detected strong LFP desynchronization. Morning. High risk of network fragmentation at nodes EC4A-EF22. Rebooting process N Cortex 7101. Chicago. I open my eyes, raising my head to look away from the computer screen in front of me and towards the voice source. Everything looked blurry. I was confused for a second until I remembered I'd removed my eyeglasses to take a short rest. Had I fallen asleep? Damn it. I found the glasses next to the keyboard and put them back on, blinking hard to clear my vision as I looked at the person who talked. Eric, my husband, stood leaning against the door frame of my office, a paper cup and a streaming cup of coffee in his hand. What was that? I asked, my voice sounding slurry. I said, uh, we've lost Chicago. It's been bombed. Argon, I asked almost immediately. Went dark an hour ago, destroyed likely. I let out a long sigh, closing my eyes again and resting my head back on the seat. Crap, I said. Right. Odd that I was more concerned at the loss of a laboratory than the city itself. It made me feel a pang of guilt. But after witnessing so much destruction, so much death, it was harder to conceptualize or so care anymore. There was simply no way to relate, to put a face on the millions of dead people, to visualize the lost lives, the destroyed families, rather than a number. A cold statistic, one more destroyed city. But Agona was an impact at me in a more direct way, impacted us, losing people there, some of whom had sent me mails and were still sitting at read in my inbox, losing their research, their supercomputers. It was another roadblock, another hurdle to overcome. In a way, it felt like being trapped in a nightmare I couldn't wake from. One of those where you can see the exit, and you run towards it, but the faster you run, the further the exit moves away from you. You can never reach it, never escape the malevolent forces chasing you right on your heels. I glanced at the code and diagrams displayed on my screen, then the coffee cup in my husband's hand. Is that for me? I asked. He eyed me with suspicion. How long have you been working for? Um, honestly, I don't know anymore. Hannah, I know, I know, I said, raising my hands. I'll take a nap or something once I'm done with this. Eric shook his head, but walked into the office and placed the cup on my desk, next to my empty can of soda. He then stopped right behind my chair, resting his hands on my shoulders, and leaned over to look at the screen. Again with the transfer function, he asked. Yeah, I said, reaching for the cup and its tasty, tasty contents. I think I can still optimize performance by 1.2 more, which should reduce the memory gaps in the neural scans being done faster, but these equations Andrew added are obtuse as hell. Why don't you ask him to help you? I turned to look at my husband, raising an eyebrow. I don't know, because he's a jerk, maybe? Hannah, I swear to God, Eric, if you give them the yay teamwork bullcrap thing again, I'm going to pour this whole cup of coffee all over your head. He chuckled, as if you'd waste perfectly good coffee. Don't try me, I muttered, taking a sip, the holy nectar bringing me new life to my body. Just um, don't lose sight of the big picture, okay? I nodded. All right, whatever. I'll give it another try, then go and ask the jerk if I still can't figure it out. And sleep. There'll be some time for sleep after we've all have, um... I paused, not wanting to finish the sentence. Not that I needed to. I felt Eric's hand squeezing my shoulders. Awesome... And now I was crying. We'd ruined the mood. Freaking genius. That's me. Sending sick term signal. Suspending neural oscillation. Stopped execution of core networks. Saving cache contents to PB storage. Link node A084. Flushing cache. Processing stopped. N Cortex 7101. I was sitting in my usual chair at the meeting room right before the end of the table and next to a large projector screen. I played with the pen in my hands, making it spin around my thumb. It was still a work in progress, though. I hadn't fully learned the mechanics of the pen spinning yet, and sometimes it would fly out of my hand and clatter across the central table. I did so now, attracting the gazes of Oliver and Emily. 
Andrew, could you please stop doing that? Oliver said. I clicked my tongue and placed the pen on the table, aligning it with my notebook. When he went back to looking at his own papers, I placed the hand flat on the table and started tapping my fingers rhythmically to the tune of uh, We Will Rock You. Oliver shot me a murderous look, but I ignored him. Ever since he lost his children when Vancouver got bombed, he had been unbearable to work with. Easy to enrage, especially when I was around. It's not that it wasn't as sad and everything. I got that, but the guy acted like he was the only one who knew what losing people was like. Well, frick that. Welcome to the club. I looked at my watch while we waited for the lovebirds to arrive. The daily meetings annoyed me, half an hour that I could invest in doing something productive rather than listening to everyone babbling about their own problems, as if we were a group therapy. We all had things to work on. We all were so far behind schedule that we didn't even have schedules anymore, and that was exactly why we didn't need these things to distract us even further. This time, though, I was actually interested in what Eric would have to say. After Algoni was gone, kaput, we all knew that there would be changes to the project. I could guess what they would be, but uh, it would be nice to know for certain. Hannah entered the room, carrying a perennial cup of coffee, but rather than sitting down, she approached me. I raised an eyebrow. That was a curiosity, right? Uh, raising eyebrows. Andrew, she said, um, um, I've been going over the transfer function. Again, I asked. Yes, again, she said. I've been trying to figure out what the code you added. Um, have you read the docs? Your face gave me an expression I didn't understand. Angry? Confused? Whatever. Yes, Andrew, I've read the docs, but the last variable is not documented, and the code is not clear about what it does. Ah, that's probably the time derivative of the local field potential. And what did she mean that the code wasn't clear? It was pretty self-explanatory. Hannah's mouth opened slightly, and her eyebrows perked up as she turned towards her seat. That was, uh, inspiration, insight. You're welcome, I said, but Eric was already entering the room and closing the door behind him. We all stared at him in silence. War, the kind of total war where survival was at stake, brought not only destruction, but also technological advances. Unprecedented leaps, the kind that were just possible in peacetime. It was as if people didn't realize the importance of research until someone else was trying to kill them with a bigger gun. So, just like World War II had brought the rocket engines and power of atoms, the current one would unlock new sources of energy, automated 3D printing factories and assembly lines, computerized flying war drones, and the secrets of the consciousness and artificial intelligence. Maybe even virtual immortality, if we could pull that one off. Emily would have something poetic to say about it, probably. Something about beautiful things coming out of bad ones, about butterflies having ugly beginnings, or whatever. This, our work here, was the modern Manhattan project of sorts, one of many across the world. Except, of course, that none of these people were Oppenheimer. None of them were Fermi. No, the Oppenheimers, the Einsteins, and the Fermis of our generation had died during the first attacks, vanished in the initial chaos. The people in this room, well, they were second best. We were fricked, in other words. Eric started talking. Good morning, I hope that you... I tuned him out and went back to working on the equation in my notebook. There was a heuristic function to determine the compatibility between separate artificial neural fields. Or human neural scans. They were basically the same thing anyways. I scribbled notes of a pseudocode for a minute, the key thing on making the networks comparable to determining the gateway nodes, and connecting that could be used to isolate the rest of the structure and treat it like a black box. And once those were enumerated, they could be matched to the counterparts in a second. The Supreme Ally Command has granted us direct authority over Custodian Program's code base. Eric was saying, I poked up at that, just like the rest of the table. The custodian, the computer program that could be given centralized control over every power plant, every autonomous factory, every jet fighter, missile battery, computer network that still existed on the planet, and we were now in its charge. They were giving us the keys to the kingdom, said Emily. Why? Eric bit his lip. I was, uh, nervous. Well, I'm afraid the ARC initiative has been terminated, he said. Command doesn't believe that we can scan for sustainable amount of civilization population to ensure... Oh crap, what? Then why are we still here? Asked Oliver. They said our research is still valuable and want us to integrate our technology into the custodian program. Everyone stood still, mulling over the significance of that single sentence. What in the bloody hell are you implying, Eric? Emily asked. 
Eric raised his arms with what I judged to be a nervous smile. Now, um, we've been through this before. We considered the different alternatives should the... Oh, enough of this bullcrap. I snapped my fingers and everyone turned to stare at me. He's saying that they want us to build Skynet, I explained. Now, can we please get back to work, Eric? Perform integrity check. Checking custodian interface link, passed. Checking PP storage, passed. Checking I.O. connectivity, passed. Checking neural nodes. Warning, structural damage found in nodes EC4A-EF22. Warning, integrity check failed. The custodian source code was, simply put, interesting, yet had a certain aesthetic, elegant, pleasant to look at. I didn't know who the original programmers had been, but I'd love to meet them and ask them about the design choices that they had made. What made it so interesting was its adaptability. The program was designed to scale, to grow organically so that more dependent units could be connected to the minimal performance impact. At its current rate of controlled thousands of installations across the world and tens of thousands of military craft and drones. And yet, it was running at a small percent of its theoretical upper limit. The problem, of course, was the complete lack of creativity. The custodian was smart for an AI program, which meant that it was pretty stupid by anyone else's standards. Currently, it depended on humans giving it orders, but that meant a lot of efficiency and coordination was lost in translation. Giving the consciousness of its own, one that could see the different units as an extension of itself, integrate the feedback into an existential mental model, might fix that. Anna and Andrew were working on that. On the consciousness problem, digitizing a human mind and putting it into the computer, I knew any day now that they would come up with a solution to the main roadblock in front of us. All the cerebral scans that we had made had enormous missing regions, holes in the mapping process that made the resulting scans useless. Unless we wanted to lobotomize the person in control of the world's entire military, that is. But they would solve it. I was sure of it, which meant that my own work was more important with each passing day. Whenever the rest of the team had the artificial consciousness ready, I would need to make sure that I'd interface with the custodian program itself and take control over its resources. It wasn't an easy task. The artificial mind would be a neural network, and the custodian was a clever yet traditionally structured computer program. Two paradigms that didn't mesh that well. My intention was to have the custodian work underneath the conscious level, as if it was some sort of reptilian brain controlling the body's vital functions, except this body would be composed of military craft, camera lenses, and 3D printing factories, rather than lungs, eyes, heart, and... yeah. The doors closed behind me and I turned to look at the newcomer, Emily, who was leaning against it with her arms crossed. Oliver, she said, tell me at least you aren't happy with this. Emily, I don't understand it. We were supposed to save humanity and now we are creating this thing, this monster, and apparently I'm the only one that has a problem with it. I shook my head. I know what you mean, Emily, I said, I really do, but you know it's true. We missed our train with the Ark. There's no way we could have fixed the scan problem and then went around town to scanning people. Have you looked at what's going on out there? She sighed. And how does this help anyone? I looked back at the source code on the screen. It um, doesn't. Not really. It's just a supreme command throwing a Hail Mary. What do you mean? I shook my head. I mean, they're desperate and think maybe that this thing will trigger a technological singularity or something, saving what's left of us in the process. Doubtful, if you ask me, but even if it doesn't, maybe something of us will survive through it. My eyes drifted towards the picture of my family that rested on my desk, and maybe, maybe it can bring justice. Retribution. That was the word, the concept, the motivation for me. The reason I was still working here, spending hours at a time submerged deep in the custodian's code, sleepless, almost without eating any food, going to the bathroom only when I couldn't hold it anymore. I didn't care about the future, about humanity, not really, not after losing my children. I knew, I knew that there was still some hope, paint as it was. I just couldn't find it in me. Retribution, justice, vengeance. Yes, I could still care about those, and if we were making a monster, like Emily said, I would go the extra mile and make sure that it was the scariest, most powerful son of a bitch in the galaxy. I would give it all, if only for the sake of avenging their deaths. 
So that's the plan then, she was saying. We choose to scan a random out of the drag base, put it in the control of the entire planet, and hope that he or she knows what they're doing. I let out a tight smile. No, the scans in the database are useless. They were done with the first encoding protocol. Too many inconsistencies. We will have to make a new one. You just said that we couldn't go out. She paused, her eyes going wide as she realized the true meaning of what I just said. You mean, uh, no. I nodded. Yes, it'll have to be one of us. Launch structural recovery process nodes EC4A-EF22. Rebuilding local indexes, propagating neural connections. Error. Could not reconnect node ED1F. Discarding node ED1F. Warning, this can result in a permanent information loss. Structural recovery process completed with one error. I glanced at the people gathering in the break room trying to judge their mental states, their worries, the problems each one had and tried to hide. Those, I discovered, were the ones most dangerous. The project had always been more likely to derail due to interpersonal conflicts than to any technical issue. Emily, for instance, worried me. She was writing in her laptop, almost if refusing to look anyone else in the eyes. I knew that she hadn't taken the cancellation of the Ark Initiative well. It had been her brainchild, after all. The idea of cheating death, of escaping the destruction of our planet by way of making virtual refuge. It wasn't surprising Command had ended up putting the plug on that. It had always been a secondary option, never receiving the same funds and resources as the other project had. The Custodian, the new power plants, the drones, and all of the projects had promised a victory, a practical result. None had delivered. Emily, she was still collaborating with the group for the time being, but I knew just how easy it would be for that to come to an end. Oliver worried me in a different way. He had poured himself into his work to an intensity that I had never seen before in him. It was a huge red flag waving over his head, of course, but I found myself unable to restrain him to tell him to take it easy, because, um, the sad truth was that we needed his work, desperately needed him to succeed. Andrew, well, Andrew was annoying. Annoying, maybe, but in a way, he was the easiest to deal with, the most predictable. As long as he had the technical problem to solve, he was content. Hannah seemed, um, okay. She had taken well to working alongside Andrew, and they had been making huge strides lately. It was a good mix. Andrew was a genius with incredible focus, but Hannah had that out-of-the-box creativity, that counter-intuitive spark that Andrew lacked. They complemented each other well, and she looked more optimistic now than she'd been at the first attack started. I was happy for that, even if it meant that she had less time to spend with me. In fact, she'd been beaming smile plastered on her face right now. I, uh, we've cracked it, she announced to the group as I entered the room and closed the door. Closing the door had become more of a ritual at this point. We were the only five people who still remained here who had decided to keep working rather than leave and spend our last days with our respective families. What do you mean? I asked. We know how to make a viable artificial consciousness out of the scans, Andrew clarified. Everyone else perked up at that. The problem, Hannah said, was that we were focusing too much on preventing the holes in the scans. A few days ago, I realized there was a dead end. We weren't making any progress, so I asked Andrew, myself, if maybe there was a way that we could fill in the missing parts instead. I talked with Andrew, and, um, it turns out we can. How? It was Emily this time. Simple, Andrew said. The gaps follow a random distribution, different for each person, which means that we can simply use scans from different people to overlay them all in a single network. The missing parts in one scan are covered by the correct information in the others. The holes don't line up, so we can resolve it to a single, complete and viable scan. Our plan is to scan all five of us, said Hannah, still beaming, and use ourselves as a basis for the superior consciousness. A silence. Emily's mouth opened, and her eyes jumped from Hannah to Andrew and then back to Hannah. Are you too bloody out of your minds? She asked. Why? Hannah asked. It'll work. It, uh, this is like taking a random pages out of five different books and mixing them into all one, Emily said, then pretending the result will make sense. It won't. It'll be rubbish. Not necessarily, Andrew said. There are millions of ways to combine the networks. Some are rubbish, but others are much better. We only need a way to evaluate them all, and then we can choose the best combination, the optimal. Which is where you come in, Emily, 
added Hannah. We need you to prepare a battery of psychological evaluation tests that we can run past the candidate networks that tells us which one is the most stable. Hold on a second, I interrupted Oliver. He said millions. How much time will it take to evaluate all the possible combinations? Andrew shrugged. More like billions. We can use the evolutionary algorithm, but it'll take a whole year. Sure, maybe more. Depends on the tests we use. It doesn't matter. We'll have the program to the custodian to do it for us, given that it will be all dead in about two months tops. Everyone glared at him. What? I can't be the only one who noticed we aren't getting our weekly supply deliveries. What about humanity? What's the point of making this thing if there's nobody left to save by the time it wakes up? Asked Emily. Hannah shrugged. It's the only option we have. We all have to cross our fingers and hope that enough people manage to find a ways to survive until it's ready. But that's out of our hands. It looked at Oliver. Can the custodian be programmed to do this? He nodded. I think so, yes. And if it's going to take that long, I can set it up to hibernate until it has chosen that perfect combination. It'll save power and hopefully stop the mother frickers in orbit from noticing something is online down here and targeting it. Yeah, I guess it can be done. I nodded. What about you, Emily? She looked at me with a fury, then at Andrew. There is no way I'm going to be part of any hive mind. It's not a hive mind, Andrew said. It'll be a single, unified consciousness. Just like you are only a single person, even if you have two brain hemispheres, the only difference is that it'll have memories and personality traits from all of us. Oh, sorry. You're not making a hive mind, you're just making a Frankenstein's monster. He paused a moment and then nodded. Yes, that would be a more appropriate metaphor. Bloody, can you also make that therapist, Andrew? Because whatever thing comes out of your process is going to need one. Then might experience what we call a moderate psychological trauma, Andrew said, but I think the plasticity of the network will allow the consciousness to integrate the different personalities into one. It might need to discard or resolve conflicting memories, of course, specifically those with more than one perspective, such as our respective memories of these meetings, but, um... Emily looked at the rest of us, shaking her head. Okay, I know that Andrew doesn't get what's wrong with this, but what about you? When did you stop trying to preserve humanity and start trying to create a monster? This is still preserving humanity, Emily, said Hannah. Your memories, your personality will live on. No, speak for yourself, she said. I would rather die a human than become that abomination. Then you'll die, said Andrew, in two months or so. Emily took a step towards him, right head with a fist clenched and her mouth in a thin line, but then turned and stormed out the room, slamming the door in her wake. So, uh, that went well. Thank you, Andrew, I said. He shrugged, just stating the obvious. What about you, Eric? Hannah asked me. Are you in? I sighed. Do you really think that this is the best option? She locked eyes with me. The best? No. The best would have been the Ark, but this... This is all we have now. This is the only way that part of us will survive. And, uh, who knows? Maybe there will be other survivors. Maybe we can help them rebuild Earth once we become a superintelligence or something. Or avenge it, said Oliver, his eyes gazing at the empty table with a strangely absent expression. All right, I said. No promises, but let me talk to Emily first. I'll do my best to convince her. Restarting process and Cortex 7104. Pre-warming cache, loading core networks, structural sum check has changed, performing Psycheval test QV. Psycheval test QV results failed. Score, minus 17 under baseline. I stood in front of that closed door, wearing a green hospital ground. Even outside the room, I could already hear the faint buzzing noise coming from the machines inside. On one hand, I didn't want to enter. This was something I'd promised myself I wouldn't do, a boundary that I'd set to myself, one that I was about to break. On the other hand, the air was cold and I wanted the door to open already, get done with it and back into my own clothes. Hannah's voice came from behind the closed door. Your turn, Emily. At last, I opened the door and entered the room, not giving myself time to think twice about it, to chicken out. The scanner dominated the room. It was a massive tutorial machine, not unlike those in which hospitals were the central opening where the patient's table slid except that one had a panels all around it and the electromagnetic components exposed, wires hanging from its sides connecting to a multitude of electronic devices and computers. It seemed Eric had been making recent changes to it. Hannah sat behind the desk in the far corner of the room, hidden from view by a large computer screens. 
It was somewhat glad to see her, and not Eric or Andrew here. You know the drill, she said, no metal past the yellow line painted on the floor, and did you take the contrast? Yes, I said, you do remember I wrote the patient protocol for these things, don't you? Yeah, yeah, just dotting the eyes. you can get on the table whenever you're ready. Sure, I said, approaching the scan table like one would a wild animal. Remind me again, why the hell did I agree to this? Um, I think you overheard we would be spending our digital afterlives with Andrew, and you couldn't face the idea of not being with him. Wasn't that it? I chuckled. I knew she was saying it was just to make me relax, but it worked. Kind of. I still thanked her as I climbed onto the table. The remote next to your hand will stop the machine if you panic, but I'd rather you don't use it. We had to start over again, and it would be a pain to reset everything. So just keep your eyes closed during the process if you're claustrophobic or something. You'd make one hell of a nurse, you know that, Hannah. The table started sliding slowly into the machine. It felt like being devoured alive by a mechanical maw. I closed my eyes. Ha! Joke's on you. My mom was a nurse. I learned all my bedside manners from her. The scanner started spinning, the noise intensifying, surrounding me, like having your head inside of a washing machine. Hey, Emily. Hannah's voice sounded far away, muted by the wall of spinning electronics. Thank you for doing this. I knew you had doubts. Still have them, but uh, becoming a super intelligence just wouldn't have been the same luster without you in there. No, I muttered. She couldn't hear me. It won't be us. As the machine spun, I tried to focus my mind on a single thought. A single idea. That of humanity. Of being human. I knew it wouldn't make a difference, of course. The scan wouldn't be influenced by my current thoughts. No, it only recorded the deeper, major structures of the brain, the patterns and the connections that made me, me, that defined my personality, that stored my long-term memories. These very thoughts, they would be lost, just like I never remembered the last thoughts I had right before falling asleep. But still, I focused all of my attention into it, just in case, ignoring the now deafening noise, the vibrations my whole body felt, making sure that if something of me made it into the final mix, if something of me remained, it would be that idea. Human. I had to remember that. I had to remain human. It was important. Searching for alternative backups. Bound. Zero. Resuming load despite Psyche Valtes QB error. Enabling I.O. connectivity. Connecting neural network to PB storage. Connecting neural storage network to custodian interface. Restarting neural oscillation. And Cortex 7104 reboot fully completed with one error. End of chapter. Chrysalis Chapter 9 Written by Beaverfur My first instinct was to get away, to run. All I wanted to do was engage my warp drive and jump back to another system, someplace safe where I could take a breath, lick my wounds and repair my damages. But of course, that wasn't an option. My warp drive would take several minutes to get ready for a jump in the best case, and I wasn't going to survive that long. No, I was trapped here. I wish I had never decided to tie myself to a single body. I knew I had done so as a way to keep myself human, a way to silence that always present inner voice that told me what I risked transforming into. But right now, I would gladly pay that price to have a way to simply transfer my mind to a different set of processor servers, the light years away from here, or even made a backup of myself, repulsive as the thought might feel to me. No, time for regret. I had to do something right now. I engaged my remaining thrusters and maneuvered so that one of my support ships would lie between myself and the starfish battleship, taking my place and being hit with a powerful energy beam. I knew it wouldn't last longer than a four or five seconds. It would take the enemy to slightly reorient the ship. I couldn't really hide my 27-kilometer body behind two-kilometer ship, but it would give me a short respite I so needed. A few seconds in which to re-engage my shields and plan my next move to figure out a way to survive this ordeal this battle had suddenly turned into. My position was desperate. I had lost my swarm. All my drones moving chaotically around the battlefield with no order or purpose. I had lost my support ships, incapable of maneuvering or returning fire. They had returned into more than sophisticated floating boulders. My own body was bleeding. There was an uncontrolled fire inside my main structure with entire sections that had lost power. 
or they were exposed to the vacuum of space. The damage wasn't catastrophic yet, and I managed to restore functionality to my shields thanks to the radiator's gambit, but I was still hit by a multitude of energy weapons, and unless they changed soon, I had no doubt that my shields would pair again and in short notice. When, when that happened, well, I knew that I wouldn't survive many more of these kinds of hits. Strange that I wasn't panicking. That I feel trapped, yes, shocked, confused, sure. But I wasn't panicking. If anything, I felt a cold anger. It was like the comeback of the memories of the destruction of Earth that seemed helplessness. These aliens were hurting me, brutalizing my body with their powerful weapons and has trapped defenseless, facing overwhelming odds. That sense of failure, of having gone this far just to be beaten down again, to be brought down to the ground, my weapons so easily stolen right out of my hands. The idea of admitting defeat and contacting the council free to offer my surrender crossed my mind, but I rejected it with disgust. No, I'd rather die. And it wasn't a figure of speech. I realized with some surprise, no, I really meant it. I'd rather die. I considered for a moment, flinging myself straight towards the planet, accelerating at top speed as my damage thrusters would provide, pushing my way through the council's defense positions through the atmosphere and crashing right into the world. How big had the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs been? About 10 kilometers, and the data banks didn't lie, I wouldn't be traveling that fast, true, but I guess that 27 kilometers worth of spaceship falling out of the sky at top speed would still be plenty destructive. And if I was going to die here, if this was as far as I would get, then I might as well go out with a bang. But I didn't do it, not yet. Instead, I considered my position, my options, trying to find some other path I could take, some vulnerability in their plan that I could still exploit, that would allow me to take back control of my drones. I needed information. I knew I was being jammed, but little more than that. Was it me, or the only ship that was receiving this attack, or was it some sort of area disruption affect the entire battlefield? Did the distance influence the jamming? Was it a single enemy ship doing this? And if so, was there a way for me to take it down? Well, my own radio sensors were useless, providing a garbled information, but those weren't the only sensors in my fleet. I reached for my support ships, asking them to check their sensors to tell me if they too were being affected by the strange distortion effect. Due to the complete communications breakdown, I had to repeat my orders several times before one of the ships replied, and when it did, it took me an effort of interpret the distorted answer, causing a mounting nausea that I was experienced to worsen. But I got my answer. Their radio sensors were working just fine, so I was the only one being jammed. Interesting, but ultimately useless. My swarm was centralized through myself, all orders and commands originating from my own body. So even if the drones would still talk to each other, they didn't have anything to say to their partners. They were all listening to me, but I couldn't talk. Or more like, I could talk, but my voice had to have been turned into some unintelligible mess, with only a few clear words here and there. I had originally thought about using a support ship's sensors to locate the source of the jamming, but given whatever was only affecting my main body, it was pointless. The other ships couldn't locate what they couldn't see in the first place. Plus, the amount of coordination that it would have required passed my current diminished capacities. A salvo of enemy missiles approached my flank. Without the swarm, I couldn't have my drones fly to intercept them. I activated my own laser projectors, tracking a few of the projectiles and burning them down, but there were just too many, and my energy weapons were too slow to get all of them. Ironic to be on the receiving end of one of my own tactics. Four missiles impacted my hull, passing through my shields and leaving gaping holes in my flank, each new explosion destroying the drone-carrying compartments and internal hangars. I relaxed a bit when I noticed the projectiles had been loaded with conventional explosives rather than nuclear warheads that I would have used. I was thankful that they weren't following my own tactics to the letter. Still, it helped me realize how precarious my situation was. The only thing to support the ship was protecting me from was a single super weapon, and even that was about to change as I could see the battleship rotating. But other than that, I was still exposed to anything the enemy wanted to throw at me. There was no way to hide. Not here. No, 
I had to find a better cover. The only available one that I could think of was to get into the thick of the swarm, surrounded by a sea of my own machines. It wouldn't be perfect, but if I had instructed the swarm to blanket me, it would offer much more protection than the remaining in the open. The problem was, I didn't really know where the swarm was anymore. Not exactly. A view of the battlefield was fragmented, conflicted between and mismatched the positions of the drones that they were reporting, and those of my own senses. I didn't see one swarm, but dozens of them, as if coming in from a parallel realities, all superimposed over each other, drones blinking in and out, moving between different planes of existence. It was hard to look at, making my processing unit struggle to find and make sense of the chaos. It felt like a building migraine. I knew I had to let go of all that information, surrender all pretense of control over my machines, even it would leave me a bit more disarmed. But I didn't second-guess myself. No time for that, really. I just went ahead and cut all communications with my own swarm, stopping all radio communications, discarding all data from my EM sensors, and relying solely on my visual and gravimetric ones. Immediately, the chasing views that I'd on the battlefield in my head were all coalesced into a single, clear picture. The mounting headache simply vanished. It was an odd picture. My drones had always been part of me, and the extension of my own body through different means. But now, for the first time ever, they looked separate. It was unsettling. It reminded me of the time when I'd been sleeping over my own arm, caused by loss of circulation. I had woken up, but it felt like a stranger's arm wrapped around me. The sea of machines looked similarly strange. They felt alien, inhuman even. Seeing them through my own senses, I couldn't perceive any of that order, that beauty that I'd experienced before. It was strangely eerie. I had the unnerving thought that the swarm was about to wake up from its slumber and start attacking me at any moment. Was this how the Zunvarians saw my drones? How they saw me? But the machines didn't attack me, of course, and I just couldn't afford the luxury of standing around until the ickiness I felt went away. So I just pushed it all to the back of my mind and focused on the immediate task, getting to cover. I identified a portion where the swarm was the thickest, a blob large enough to cover my entire body. And without thinking twice, I rushed towards it. I engaged my thrusters and accelerated, crossing the empty space as fast as I could. The moment I started moving, the starfish battleship weapon fell again on my shields, draining them fast, but this time I was counting on that, and my shields managed to hold long enough for me to reach the blob. I entered the thick of my swarm like a bowling ball, crashing into hundreds of machines, their bodies bouncing off the front of my hull, fragmenting into a sea of broken pieces, metal shards, and engine components, then followed by trail. But it worked. Every single enemy ship was shooting at me, but they had thousands of vehicles to go through before their weapons could reach my body. Their missiles couldn't find a clear path amongst the sea of floating, deactivated drones either. They exploded in the periphery, clearing out entire sections of the swarm, but still, far enough from me that they weren't an immediate threat. I had managed to get a few more minutes of respite, at least, but to do what, exactly? I wasn't sure... Could I maybe activate my warp drive now, use it to get away? Perhaps, at the rate that the enemy was burning through the swarm, I guessed that I would have time to spur it and make a short jump away before they got me. But that would require diverting the energy that was currently powering up my shields. It was a risky move. I was half blanketed by the swarm, yes. But now and then, a lucky shot would still manage to pass through and hit me for a couple seconds. Shutting down the shields would leave me only out of armor to tank the occasional damage. It should be enough, but if I were unlucky enough to get hit again by the starfish thing, my shields were down and when that happened, well, it's better not to think about it. Still, it seemed like a viable option, so I didn't discard it right away, but I wanted to try something else first. I wanted to see if I could get back my control over the swarm. I still didn't know where the jamming was originating from. It felt like I was surrounded by a small bubble of distortion effect. But I knew that I had come from somewhere else. Was it one of the enemy ships? Many of them. Or did it come from somewhere else entirely? Maybe even the planet. I just couldn't figure it out. Didn't know enough about the technology that they were using to locate its source. But now that I had removed the noise and confusion caused by the feedback coming from the faulty communications, and that I could spare the time to think, to pay attention to what was going on, I had noticed something else. 
I still had control over my outposts, my factories in the Centauri system, my resource extractors in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, my assembly lines in the Le Mans solar system. They were all working as intended. I felt a dark amusement at the idea that I could easily send orders to a drone that was light years away, while the ones just a few meters off were off limits. But the revelation was important. It meant that whatever jamming method they were using, it was only affecting the local radio spectrum. My quantum entanglement relays were still working just fine, which um, didn't help me much here. At least, not on its own. The drones around me didn't have quantum communicators. Those were hard to manufacture, and too expensive to install in each single disposable drone, especially when a simple radio transmitter sufficed. Had sufficed, I corrected myself, at least until now. But no, my quantum relays were, um, well, just that, relays. I had installed one at each outpost, and I would send a message through a quantum link, and the relay would receive it and broadcast to its own local space as a radio transmission. They had a low bandwidth and introduced a delay that made them useless in combat conditions. But in essence, they allowed me to control my outposts as if I was there. Almost. But... I had never thought of using quantum links to talk to the machines that were already next to me. After all, you don't use a telephone when you want to talk to someone who's already in the same room as you. And in my case, the drones didn't even have phones, not even my support ships, which I designed to take along with me. Except that I could always build new phones. Most of the assembly factories in my body were still operational, and while I had lost part of my raw resources and materials I was storing when some of my holding bays were destroyed, I still had plenty remaining. I could just manufacture a quantum relay, slap it into a drone's chassis, and eject it from my body, past the EM bubble and surrounding me. Hopefully, it would enable me to be reached through the quantum link, and then have it relay my orders to control the nearby swarm, just like I did my outposts. If I couldn't escape the bubble, maybe I could build me a back door. I set to work immediately, my assembly lines back into action. I decided to build not one, but two quantum relays, just so that I would have a replacement in case the council managed to destroy or jam the first one. Transporting the materials from the storage areas into the factories took some ingenuity, since the two main axial transport corridors were blocked by debris from the damage that I had suffered. Instead, I used an internal worker unit to carry the supplies through the auxiliary maintenance corridors. All the time, I was monitoring the council fleet. They were focusing their attacks onto the swarm, using their energy beams to dig a tunnel through the area of machines, their missiles taking entire chunks out of it. The drones were still moving, drifting slowly all around me, so any place that the enemy cleared was soon reoccupied by new machines. It was as if the council ships were trying to dig a hole in a sandy beach. But it was working, slowly but surely, their weapons were advancing towards me. I knew I wouldn't have much time to pull off my move. I decided to skimp on the details then. My new relay drones wouldn't have power plants of their own, like the ones I use in my outposts. No, these would work on a pre-charged batteries. I also decided against giving them the ability to move on their own. Instead, I would just set them adrift away from my body. That way, I wouldn't need to install airways, complex thrusters, and fuel lines. I was aware that these manufacturing shortcuts would mean the relay's life expectancy would be in the order of an hour or two. After that, the batteries would simply die, and they would be unable to return home. But it didn't matter. At the rate things were going, if I hadn't won by then, I would probably be dead. While I built these two relay drones, I also focused on repairing my internal injuries. I removed the oxygen still in my corridors and hangars to quench the remaining fires. I vented the leak flammable gases out of my body, so as to lower the risk of a new accidental explosions. I ran internal diagnostics, rerouted power lines and fuel pipes, and had maintenance drones start clearing the main corridors again. I noted that the living room I had built, the small reproduction of the memory from so long ago, had vanished, along with the entire storage area that it contained it which had now turned into a gaping hole exposed to space. Strange, not having noticed the loss until now, but on second thought, I guessed it wasn't so surprising. I had been more focused on survival than a pointless melancholy. I had to. Less than three minutes later, my first quantum relay drone emerged from its factory, and I had a couple work machines push it out the landing bay and into space. Calling it a drone was a bit of a misnomer, though. The contraption was just a relay cobbled together with a radio transmitter and a battery. 
Inside, an otherwise empty spacecraft chassis. Hardly my best design, but maybe the most critical one if I could use it to escape this situation. I waited for it to drift a few hundred meters away. Far enough that I knew that it would be crossed to the bubble of the jamming distortion. I reached to it through my newly established quantum link and ordered it to relay my transmission back to the EM spectrum. Immediately, the swarm came back into focus. Hundreds of thousands of machines popping into my awareness, eagerly awaiting my orders. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. With a mental smile, I accessed my machine's own EM sensors, relying on them instead of my still jammed ones on my main body. I restarted the attack patterns, ordering the drones to move forward again, towards the enemy, to engage their weapons to surround the council ships. The council fleet's weapons were quick, too, getting back to the defensive, their weapons focusing again to bring down the approaching swarm. I started building back the complexity I'd lost, the shield, drones, grouping, and swirling pattern formations The Immediately, I realized that it wouldn't work. I was aware that the quantum link's bandwidth would be too limited, that there would be an extra delay to my orders, but the idea of regaining control over my swarm had been too appetizing, too critical to second guess. But now that I was back in control, I was reminded of just why I had never fought from the safety of my other systems, why I had always been on the front lines rather than relaying my orders through quantum link to an attack swarm light years away. It simply wouldn't work. My drones were too stupid, their simple processing units only valid for receiving orders and executing them. They couldn't coordinate an attack on their own, move as a group or support each other, let alone engage an enemy and flank them in a complex spiral formation. They relied on me for all of that, my mind the only one with the big picture of the ongoing battle. It was me who told each and every machine what to do and when to act how long to accelerate for, and how far to move down to the meter with a custom specific orders. But the quantum link didn't have enough bandwidth for me to do that for the entire swarm. My attack patterns weren't developing as fast as the complexity I needed them to be. I just couldn't get my messages fast enough through to the machines, and by the time the recipients finally got them, the order's validity had already expired. So I had to decide. I could control the entire swarm with a very low degree of precision, just like it did my mining outposts, giving me simplistic general orders that didn't require precision or complex coordination. And that would surely make the swarm as a whole easy to defend against, a losing strategy. Or I could mount a very convoluted attack that was used only a small fraction of all the machines, having the rest of the swarm lay still in waiting its turn, marking the unattended machines as easy prey. Another losing strategy. I felt like screaming in frustration. I played my last card, one that I hadn't realized I ever had. And for what? For it to prolong my agony, my defeat. And soon enough, I wouldn't even have that decision for myself, since I wasn't going to even have a swarm for too long, seeing as how the council fleet was fighting off the incoming sea of machines easily burning through them, the ships moving out of the way of my transports and predictable patterns. No... It hurt, but I had to admit, I wasn't going to win here. In fact, if I stayed the course, I was going to lose. My swarm was going to be destroyed, and then nothing would stop them from finishing me off. I wasn't going to take out this keystone world. The Zunbu Republic wasn't going to collapse. Not today. No. Today, I was fighting for survival. Today, I was fighting to have the chance to fight again tomorrow. And with that acceptance, I came to a liberation of sorts. If my swarm was already all but lost, then I didn't need to care about preventing it from some attack against the planet that wasn't going to happen now. It freed my mind to consider a new, more aggressive tactics. I wasn't going to win, but could I somehow turn the sound defeat into a more of a tie? Could I prevent the enemy from pressing this advantage? Give them wounds of their own that they would need to lick while I retreated and regained the strength that I'd lost today? In other words, could I sacrifice my swarm to utterly destroy an entire council fleet? A quick check of what remaining on the sea of machines told me that, yes, perhaps I could. But the plan would be risky. If I didn't time it perfectly, it could be well be an accidentally killing myself. And even if I did execute it without zero error, it was up to chance whether it would be successful or leave me in an even worse position. And um, I realized that I didn't care. The last move failed to take out the council fleet. Then I would do just as I thought before and fling my 27 kilometers self into the planet as fast as I could, put an end to it. 
So, with a strangely liberating thought, I decided to go ahead. I couldn't give out complex, personalized orders to my machines, not using the cumbersome relay system, but I wouldn't need a complex orders for this. Just a simple order, an exact same for the each and every drone. Follow me. I didn't wait to see if they did. I engaged my thrusters and accelerated as fast as I could, away from the battlefield, in the opposing direction from the planet, away from the enemy fleet. After a few instants, a cloud of machines followed me into a hurried retreat. The council fleet stood still for a few seconds, maybe debating whether to call it a day or let me escape, or to follow me and try and finish me off. But I knew what their answer would be. They were like sharks attracted to the smell of blood. They were winning. They knew that they were winning, and they wanted my head as a trophy. And of course, they pursued me. I flew as fast as my damaged thrusters allowed me, the cloud of drones training behind me like a comet trail. And behind them, almost the entirety of the enemy fleet followed, their battleships and destroyers having abandoned their previous formations. I let the chase go on, continuously measuring the distance between my main body and the nearest drones. Too close. I knew that it was too close. Immediately, I realized I had overestimated the speed that I could still reach, but I did my best, pushing my thrusters even further. Every meter I could gain, I knew increased the chances of surviving this crazy maneuver and that I was about to pull. But every second that passed also increased the chances that the enemy would wise up about what I was trying to do. Should I pull the trigger now and risk hitting myself, or wait and risk the whole ploy failing? A difficult dilemma. I had expected that to have gained more of an initial distance to the cloud of drones, but the damage I had received earlier had affected my acceleration more than I had anticipated. I did a quick calculation and discovered that I would need to let those chase go on for some five minutes before I could completely be safe. It was too long, of course. On second thought, maybe this had to be a terrible idea, but I knew I was committed to it for now. For better or worse, already gone past the point of no return. I had to pull the trigger. I knew I was delaying. I didn't want to do it, but, um... I sent another order to my swarm, another simple one directed to all the machines at the same time. Stop. They stopped decelerating and moving forwards, getting away from the blob as fast as I could. Every meter counted. The enemy fleet reacted fast too, but I knew that it was already too late for them. Some of their ships tried to alter their trajectory to avoid entering the thick of the swarm. Others focused on the energies and deaccelerating, rotating on their axis, and trying their best to reduce their speed. But of course, the laws of physics being as they were, it was futile. Their battleships and destroyers simply could not stop as fast as my nimble drones could. Too much momentum, too much mass to decelerate, as one, the council fleet died right into the cloud of machines. During the entire battle, the enemy had been aware of a shell game that I was playing. They had done their best to stay away from the thick of the swarm, knowing that a sudden and unexpected destruction that awaited those ships that caught caught within. And now, all of them, all their warships, all their destroyers and cruisers and battleships and frigates were right in the middle of my sea of drones. I checked the distance again. Was it safe? No, not by a long shot. But it would have to do. I sent my last order. Again, a simple one directed to all the machines, but only about 70,000 of them understood. The ones carrying the thermonuclear warheads. Detonate. It felt like staring into a nova, all my senses simultaneously saturating from the white-hot flesh and delivering an input overload to my mind that registered as actual pain. A piercing agony that lasted just a single, endless instant. A burning pain that I could feel shattering the walls of my sanity, as if I was experiencing days worth of torture compressed into a single tick of the clock, into a few milliseconds that it took for the senses to mercifully burn out, for my entire outer hull to combust. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.